I think uh, we're about to start. Welcome everyone. It's very good to see you here on site with these uh, large numbers on this very sunny day. And also welcome for the people uh, watching watching online. Uh, my name is Zara Kars. I am your moderator tonight. I'm a program maker and uh, public historian at the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Study. Um, tonight's or today's talk is part of the NIAS talk series. This is a monthly series organized by the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Study. Um, this is a research institute where every year we welcome 30 to 50 scholars, artists, writers, journalists to work on individual interdisciplinary and most of all state-of-the-art research projects. And during these talks we invite our fellows, uh, as we call them, to engage with other uh, other academ academics or journalists or artists. Um, so more about today's talk. Um, we will explore two major phenomena that it could be me but um, seem to be everywhere these days. The internet and conspiracy theories. Um, conspiracy theories, misinformation and disinformation have become increasingly prominent uh, in the last decade, especially on social media. Most of, us, most of us have heard of QAnon or the Deep State or the Great Reset uh, or have, a crumb, uh, have uh, come across theories on how COVID-19 was developed as a sort of bioweapon. Um, and of course, as the war in Ukraine is developing as well, um, we keep hearing about how Putin's worldview has long been shaped by conspiracy theories of how the West is secretly controlling independent states like Ukraine. Um, and the question I guess we'll try to answer tonight is how to deal with all these theories and what is their relation to the internet as a phenomenon. Or, in other words, how should we understand the relation between the internet and the making and shaping of conspiracy theories? Um, we will discuss this with two great speakers. Uh, with us are Peter Knight, Professor of American Studies at the University of Manchester uh, and current fellow at NIAS, and Sarah Polak. Uh, she's a university lecturer at the Leiden University Center of the Arts uh, in Society. And maybe some of you also saw on the invitation that Marlene Sticker would be joining us tonight, but unfortunately she's ill and won't be able to attend tonight's event. Um, so what's the setup? Peter will briefly present some of his thoughts, insights, and um, afterwards, Sarah and I will join him on stage for a discussion. Uh, you're all welcome to join the discussion. All questions are allowed, but please do keep them short. Um, so before I give Peter the floor, let me briefly introduce you a little bit. Um, as I mentioned, he's current fellow at NIAS, professor of American studies, and an expert on conspiracy theories, both offline and online. Um, and he's published many books on the subject. And during his fellowship, so his period that he's at NIAS, he will really dive into the online conspiracies. Um, and I think, if I'm right, he'll be talking about that now as well. So, Peter, the floor is yours. So thank you very much, um, Sara, for putting this together. And uh, thank you to, uh, to Sara for uh, agreeing to be on the panel. And thank you all for coming. This is the first in-person talk I've given for two years, I've just realized. So for me, it is, um, it is quite exciting. So... How worried should we be about this? That's my question. So the good news is that this is not a new variant of COVID. The bad news is that it shows the Twitter convergences with people using the hashtags Ukraine and bioweapon. So 
this new conspiracy theory that is spreading virally around the internet began with this obscure account called War Clandestine, who was speculating about the, the idea that the invasion of Ukraine might have been all about Putin trying to take out these supposed US biolabs in Ukraine. The idea of this conspiracy theory is that, um, uh, you know, this is put forward by uh, a QAnon account. The idea is that COVID was supposedly manufactured in one of these Ukrainian bio labs. And in fact, the deep state or uh, the New World Order or the Illuminati are planning to take control of the world through these planned pandemics, these plandemics. And all of this is part of the so-called Great Reset. And if you've read Thierry Baudet's new book, you might see where this is going. So what we see is a vicious circle of amplification between the margins and the mainstream. It goes from those kind of QAnon and Twitter accounts on the margins. It then gets picked up by conspiracy entrepreneurs like Alex Jones and his site Infowars. And then uh, it gets uh, taken up by social media accounts who are using hashtags like globalist or new world order or often kind of anti-Semitic uh, conspiracy overtones. This one on the bottom right is talking about the Kazarian um, influences in, in Ukraine, which is all kind of part of some kind of Illuminati anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. Then the um, right-wing Twitter sphere picks it up. So this is zooming into that picture I began with, and this is showing the influen influential accounts of people like Jack Posobiec, who amplify what originally started off as quite marginal accounts. This then gets picked up by right-wing uh, commentators in the US, this guy Tucker Carlson on Fox News. It gets them picked up by right-wing politicians, but also, crucially, it then gets amplified by um, Russian propaganda. The Kremlin are delighted that Tucker Carlson is spouting this uh, what seemingly uh, uh, kind of Russian propaganda for them. So, Round and round it goes. The Russian embassies are uh, endlessly now tweeting this conspiracy theory. This might seem a kind of bizarre belief, but like most conspiracy theories, there is often a kernel of truth at the heart of it. There is sometimes some basis to it. What I want to talk about this evening are two questions raised, I think, by that image. The first question is... At the heart of the project, I'm engaged in at NIAS, but also a larger project over the next two or three years. And that's the question, what difference has the internet made to the creation and to the spread of conspiracy theories? The second question is, what, if anything, should we do about this? So the debate goes like this. One side of the debate says... The internet has changed everything. So there are three golden rules of conspiracy theories. First, nothing happens by accident. Second, nothing is as it seems. And third, everything is connected. And that idea of the interconnectedness of the world is what um, conspiracy, or rather conspiracy theories, find a natural home on the internet. This is how the argument goes. On the internet, everything is connected, and for conspiracy theories, everything is connected. That hyperlinking that the internet enables makes conspiracy theories much easier to produce and also to consume and to spread. It enables like-minded people to connect more easily in a way that in the past was much harder. It also means that those traditional gatekeepers of knowledge in the media or academia are bypassed. Everyone can become a publisher. Everyone can produce professional-looking 
news sites. There's also the idea that the anonymity, particularly of social media, increases the production of conspiracy theories. There is something to this argument, but I think we also need to recognize that um, polarization uh, is already happening whether there is anonymity or not. Conspiracy theories also spread easily on, on the internet because of the ease of engagement. It costs nothing to like, um, to, um, to forward, to um, pass along to your followers. There's a low barrier to entry for conspiracy theorizing on the internet. In a way that when I first started looking at this stuff in the 1990s, I used to have to send off to these obscure mail order companies to get weird fanzines and other things. Now, it just comes across your social media feed, whether you like it or not. And the sheer volume, the sheer repetition of conspiracy theories on the internet makes the promotion of them much, much more serious. But we also need to recognize, therefore, the role of the recommendation algorithms of not just Google, but also social media platforms like YouTube and Facebook. These are the instruments that are promoting conspiracy theories in a way that I think is quite new and quite important. Those recommendation algorithms, the argument goes, create echo chambers that produce an intensification of um, people uh, spouting conspiracy theories to one another. And that produces a situation, people have argued, in which we have entered a, 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 an era of post-truth where nothing is taken entirely seriously as fact anymore and that those traditional uh, gatekeepers or um, people who um, value truth and objective knowledge, the media, politicians, scientists, are no longer regarded as the ultimate authorities. Okay, so that's the first side of the argument, the idea that everything uh, has changed. The other side of the coin is the argument that the internet has changed nothing. I think we need to be careful not to engage in a moral panic about the dangers of social media, not to over-exaggerate the threat of social media and blame social media for causing an unprecedented explosion of conspiracy theories in the public sphere. Because we need to remember, after all, conspiracy theories have been around for a long time, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But we also need to recognize that other media, legacy media, play as important a role as social media. In that example I began with, Fox News is as important as Facebook and Twitter in spreading the theory. We also need to recognize that conspiracy theories aren't necessarily any more popular than they have been in the past. Instead, we need to understand that what we're looking at is greater visibility of conspiracy theories. So if we take uh, some recent examples, and these statistics are from the US. Uh, in the Netherlands, uh, the figures are slightly lower, but about 10% of people believe that COVID is somehow related or um, caused by 5G mobile phone technology. 20% of Americans believe that there are microchips in the COVID vaccine, and 30% believe that the pandemic was orchestrated in advance. Those figures are not, that they might be alarming, they might be disturbing, but they're not necessarily any higher than for other conspiracy theories that have been around for a long time. Between five and 10% of Americans believe that the moon landings were faked, 25% um, of Americans believe that the government knew about the attacks on 9-11 in advance. And uh, currently about 50% of Americans think that Lee Harvey Oswald was not a lone gunman, that there was a conspiracy. If we go further back still, 
in the 18th century, we need to recognize that actually seeing the world through the lens of conspiracies was perfectly normal. In fact, a quite sophisticated form of political thought in the Enlightenment. And if you've ever read beyond the opening paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, you'll realize that the founding fathers of the US were, in modern day parlance, paranoid. They were just spouting one long conspiracy rant. And yet, at the time, this was a sophisticated way of understanding political action. So one way of arguing that the internet has changed nothing is the suggestion I've heard from the security services, for example, that actually we don't need to worry about conspiracy theories on the internet because ultimately, uh, the echo chamber will play in our favor. That actually this is quite good because conspiracy theorists will just talk to one another and eventually they'll fizzle out, that they won't infect the mainstream. I'm not entirely convinced of that, but um, then there's a more utopian theory still from the early days of the internet that suggested that the internet will be a marketplace of ideas Truth will eventually triumph in this marketplace of ideas. And so in the long term, we don't need to worry about conspiracy theories on the internet. Once again, I'm not entirely convinced by that because I think what we've realized over the last 30 years is that early utopian vision of the internet as a marketplace of ideas has been substituted by a highly monetized, marketized, form of so-called free speech. And then in fact, in fact, what we're seeing is the way that social media promotes culture wars and weaponizes propaganda. So I think there are strengths and weaknesses on both sides of the argument. And the project that I'm engaged in now is trying to work out the, where we stand on that. And the way we're doing that in this project is bring, to try and bring together big data and close reading. Now, one of the problems of studying conspiracy theories online is just the sheer scale of it. 500 hours of YouTube content are uploaded every hour of every day. 500 million tweets are posted every day. So the sheer volume of human expression that is out there on the internet means that as much as I have been trained in literary studies to be a slow and careful close reader, I am not going to be able to get through even one minute's worth of conspiracy theories on the internet. There's a second problem, which is transparency. Now, um, social media companies are um, private companies, and they don't allow full, unfettered access to researchers. We know a lot about what's going on, because obviously social media is there in the public realm. But what we don't know, for example, is what individuals actually encounter on their social media feeds. So one of the ways that we're doing this project is to combine the view from big data using um, machine learning to try and understand the patterns and the developments. But also, we're employing ethnography, this forms a kind of anthropology, to understand what the internet looks like for people who encounter it. The other reason that understanding conspiracy theories on the internet is difficult is that a lot of it is ironic. And unfortunately, you can't teach a computer to understand the irony. Or well, we're trying, but so far failing. So what we're doing is combining kind of the bird's eye view from big data and the worm's eye view from close reading. And what we're really interested in are what are called platform affordances, those specific design features and financial incentives that make the ways that conspiracy theories are produced and consumed quite distinctive in the internet era. So our argument is that none of this is new. 
but we're trying to identify the specific ways that the internet in general and social media in particular intensifies the kinds of processes and trends that as a historian of conspiracy theories I've been tracing since the 18th century, even earlier. So, if you ever ask me what my view on conspiracy theories is, this cartoon says everything I have ever wanted to say about the topic. Anyway, so the question I always get asked is, what, what should we do about this? So I want to kind of think through some of these ideas. But in order to do that, we need to kind of work through some ideas that most people, journalists, academics, and probably most of us as ordinary citizens hold about conspiracy theories, which I think are inaccurate. First of all, the stereotype of the conspiracy theorist as an unwashed, middle-aged, bearded man in his parents' basement. That's just not true. So the political scientists and the social psychologists tell us. On average, there are no significant differences in conspiracy belief between men and women, between white and black, between rich and poor. The only significant difference, um, and even then it's quite marginal, marginal, is level of education. But the most accurate predictor for belief in conspiracy theory is someone already believes in other conspiracy theories, which doesn't tell us much. However, although the stereotype in general is wrong, for particular conspiracy theories, it can be more accurate. So we need to think about different kinds of conspiracy theories. Anti-vaccination beliefs tend to be favored more by women. Moon landing conspiracy theories, and this is mainly anecdotal evidence from people who endlessly email me, are mainly men. The other thing is we need to recognize that conspiracy theories, belief in conspiracy theories, is not a sign of some kind of bizarre, abnormal psychology. Thinking about conspiracies is quite widespread and is quite normal. And in fact, opinion polls show that most people, possibly as high as 80, 90 percent of people, believe in at least one conspiracy theory. And if I had time, I'd ask you all individually to confess the one conspiracy theory that you believe in. But of course, you know, that's one of the important things about conspiracy theory. It's always other people who are conspiracy theorists. The very label is not neutral and objective. In effect, it is an insult that we apply to other people's beliefs. So of course, I, I, my beliefs, are not conspiracy theories. My beliefs are rational and sensible. But when you ask people a whole long list of ideas that are called conspiracy theories, most people will tick one of the boxes. What I think those opinion polls show, though, is more complicated. And I think this is increasingly the case, that what we need to worry about is not that people believe in things that are untrue, it's that increasingly people no longer believe in things that are true. So it's the large number of people who reply don't know in the questionnaires that I worry about because I think a lot of us find ourselves in that position in a world that is saturated with information. We find it hard to ever ultimately know for certain where we stand on some of these things. After the 2016 US presidential elections, the smart view on the street was, it's all Russian disinformation. All those conspiracy theories and kind of fake news and disinformation out there, it's all planted by the Russians. Now, I think that's exaggerated, but we can never ignore the possibility that actually there is a large amount of sophisticated, weaponized Kremlin propaganda. The purpose of which is not to persuade you of one particular false view. Instead, the purpose is to muddy the water, to pollute the information ecosystem. 
The other thing we need to remember is that conspiracy theories are not really a sign of paranoia. Instead, I would argue, they are expressions of quite real grievances. At the literal level, most conspiracy theories are complete and utter nonsense. But I want to suggest that we need to understand where these conspiracy theories come from and take seriously the fact that a lot of people feel increasingly disconnected from political and media and scientific authorities. We need to understand that conspiracy theories very nearly get the story right. The problem with conspiracy theories is not that they are hopelessly wrong, it's that they're almost right. They actually begin to edge towards an understanding of these kind of deeper structural problems with society. But unfortunately, they deflect attention from the real problems or they distort the real problems. Conspiracy theorists are often accused of being paranoid and a lot of the work done in this field is done by psychologists who are trying to understand the inner psychology of conspiracy theorists. Why is it that they have so much distrust I would put the question the other way around and suggest we need to ask why is it that so many of our political and public, public institutions are untrustworthy? Okay, so conspiracy theories are not caused by a lack of information or false information alone. And that means that debunking and fact-checking in themselves are never going to be enough. Don't get me wrong, they are vitally important, but they're never going to convince a committed conspiracy theorist because a lack of information or wrong information is not what's causing a conspiracy theorist's beliefs. Instead, conspiracy theories are connected with a deep-seated worldview, a deep emotional commitment to a certain form of understanding. My feelings don't care about your facts to reverse the kind of right-wing put-down for so-called um, millennial sn snowflakes, the idea that um, facts don't care about feelings. So conspiracy theories are to do with identity and belonging and not to do with kind of rational argument. Another suggestion that social psychologists have put forward is pre-bunking, i.e. kind of warning people in advance about the misinformation they will receive. Or sometimes the metaphor is used of inoculation. These processes can be quite effective. I, you know, I've seen the, the cases, but the effect doesn't last for very long. And the reason for that is that ultimately people won't give up their deep-held worldview and sense of identity easily. Conspiracy theories indeed can often cause social harm of we, as we've seen during the COVID pandemic, but we also need to recognize that conspiracy theories for some people provide a great deal of enchantment. They make the world meaningful. But we also need to recognize that for other people, particularly those on the alt-right, figures like uh, um, Thierry Baudet in, here in the Netherlands, um, the position they're taking up is not necessarily true and passionate belief, but it's this kind of shifting grounds of ir irony. Whenever you can oppress them, they'll say, well, I, I didn't fully mean that. Conspiracy theories, therefore, I think need to be compared uh, to religion rather than a set of factual beliefs. But they also need to be compared to a form of game play, they provide those pleasures. And if you look at something like QAnon, QAnon is both a religion, but also it's a form of LARPing, live action role play uh, game. Okay, so recommendations. What comes out of this? First of all, deplatforming does work sometimes, but we need to be really careful because it is in danger of slipping into censorship. We need to think really carefully before we engage in mass deplatforming. So sometimes it's necessary and sometimes it's justified when it's beyond free speech into incitement, encouragement of violence. 
and obviously there are important cases happening here in the Netherlands at the moment with uh, not just Thierry Baudet but uh, Willem Engel. The argument is that free speech is perfectly justified but incitement to violence is not. The second idea then is that instead of deplatforming, we need to think about demotion. We need to think about changing the recommendation algorithms of the social media platforms so that they do not push conspiracy theories and other forms of misinformation. The right to free speech is not the same thing as the right to amplification. So we need to audit the algorithm. One of the real problems of research in this area is that social media companies will never reveal how their algorithms work. But we also need to recognize that there is no quick technological fix. Yes, we need to change the algorithm, but changing the algorithm is not in itself going to change the bigger picture. We need to think not just about the pipelines of supply, but we need to think about the underlying reasons for demand. Why do people feel so much emotional investment in these narratives? We therefore need to understand that self-regulation by the social media platforms is never going to be enough. In the last few years, they indeed have begun to uh, change their ways. First, after some of the uh, horrific mass shootings around the world, and then most recently in response to the corona pandemic. So there has been some quite dramatic change in a way that only a couple of years ago seemed unimaginable. But we can't rely on social media platforms feeling some vague moral pressure or uh, reputational threat. Instead, we need to think about regulation. And at the moment, the Digital Services Act in the EU is being debated, and the Online Harms Bill in the UK is also currently going through Parliament. These are the crucial instruments that, gonna, that are going to shape the internet of the future. Ultimately, what we need to do is redesign the infrastructure and the incentives of social media companies. I think we need to get back to some of those early pioneering elements of the internet that uh, Marlene St Sticker's book uh, talks about. And we need to think about creating what I would suggest, and many other people have su suggested, would be a public service internet. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, Sarah and I will now join you on stage. And Sarah, please be careful here with these uh, wires. I'll, I'll leave the recommendations on because I think that might be uh, nice for the discussion as well. Thanks so much. That was really insightful. I've been writing down lots of things and I think I, th I think Sarah as well. Um, Sarah, I think before we open up the discussion, I am very curious on, on your thoughts on uh, Peter's presentation. Um, before you take off, a quick uh, introduction as well. Sarah Polak is a university lecturer at the Leiden University, university Center for the Arts and Society. She is specialized in the cultural and media politics of image making of US presidents and their use of social media. And currently Polak is a research fellow in the NWO project Playing Politics, Media Platforms Making Worlds, which if I'm correct, researches Donald Trump's social media communication. This is my project. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, it's uh, good to have you here, and um, well, I guess um, first response to Peter's uh, th thoughts. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I'm not totally sure if my microphone's working. It is, right? Yeah, thank you. 
And thank you, Peter. It was great to hear you talk about this. And um, uh, I know you, of course, from Leiden. Um, and this project is fascinating. I wanted to start with a confession, which is that I'm always very confused about... Um, I have a sort of confusion between conspiracy theorists on the one hand and the conspiracy on the other. So I always wonder which is the conspiracy, the, the adherence to the conspiracy theory, or because they both seem like these sort of coteries of people in the know, whether it is they're co a coterie of people in the know about because they're conspiring to do something or because they know about the conspiracy. <laughs> and, and so I think there's a sort of... Uh, and, and I, I have, particularly with the term Illuminati, are the Illuminati the people who are the deep state? I think that is the correct answer. Mm -hmm. Or are they the people who know about what the deep state is doing? Um, and I think that is not just my confusion. Um, so if you, if some of you may have come across um, uh, Russell Muirhead and Nancy Rosenblum's book, um, lots of people are saying, right? The title is lots of people are saying and basically their argument is modern conspiracism is conspiracy without the theory. So it says a lot of people are saying, you know, whatever you hear, it's, it's bullshit. It's what you're talking about as well. Um, but there isn't a sort of detailed idea about what an alternative reality. What, what, is then, what is the accusation then precisely and what proof is there for that accusation? And I think that's, that's part of what, what causes this confusion, is that the sort of coterie that's in the know, it doesn't really matter what they're in the know of, what, what it's uh, for the... And so that also then leads me to think, and you, you were also referring to that, that actually um, a group of conspiracy theorists, like a group of conspirators, is a sort of... Um, like a form of like a mode of sociality, a mode, a form of community in a world, of course, where what community is isn't is 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 shifting, and social media, whichever way you turn it, have some sort of role in that. Which is not to say that, as you say, that social media changes everything or leaves everything in place. Um, so I've also, as you know, been thinking a lot about the notion of constituencies. So the political. Um, you know, traditionally a constituency is geographically, um, you know, it's, it's sort of the geographical constituency, especially in a, a district voting system as the US or the UK systems are. A politician has a constituency which is, you know, a, a, a district or a neighborhood who, who vote for that, uh, that MP or that representative. Um, and increasingly these constituencies are more sort of defined I have the impression by the internet. So a hashtag can mobilize a political constituency. And, and, and so I think, I think of both sort of groups of conspiracy theorists and, and constituencies as something that has always a, a mode of, of, of sociality or of group formation that is shifting in some way through the internet because it exists in part on the internet and its, its affordances also um, you know, shape to some extent what that is. But ultimately, I also really agree with the second theory. Nothing has changed in the sense that whenever you, you follow, you know, on Reddit or wherever uh, discussions of, of, of conspiracy theorists, for instance, QAnon, um, it always strikes me how much what they do with little groups, like pursuing these clues and trying to make sense of them, is exactly like my own research project playing politics. It's like a group of people who, who are very enthusiastic about something, th things that they feel are connected, but they have to get to the heart of how exactly is it connected. Does, you know, um, the, what constitutes what is always a big discussion, and that's in QAnon as, as in my own research. And I think that very enjoyment, that very so sociality is um, really important almost the process more than the actual content. Um, I realize that I now sound as though I think this is all very positive. I, that, I, don't, <laughs> I think it has 
very dangerous, it can have very dangerous results in the real world. In, in many ways, I would see the insurrection of the 6th of January as, as a kind of escalation of, of something like that. Um, and um, yeah, so the, uh, the, um, a, few, a few things that I wanted to um, think about also because they have a direct relation with my playing politics project or the, the project that I'm a, a research fellow in is that it's um, the idea that, that um, both play and politics are modes of or ma means of constituting a world. And I think a lot of conspiracy theory is doing that as well. It's sort of playing a game, if you will, that, that shapes up, that creates a world that then you know, gives all kinds of actually endless enjoyment. And you know, it's, it, that is, in a sense, no different than you know, if we had a ball here and we divided the room into two halves and we started to play a game. Um, you know, that ball turns this room into a play space. And I think that's something that, that a lot of that theory, in combination with the affordances, sort of the, 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 the allowances or the invitations that, um, of, of social media platforms, um, also does. Um, so I, I'm, um, I read, I, in general, I really agree with you in the sense that, you know, <laughs> between the internet changes everything and the internet changes nothing, um, there, there is, of course, a lot of space and somewhere <laughs> is, <laughs> I think, um, in, in the middle is, is uh, the best approximation of, of, but I also, but what I wanted to add and, and uh, is that I think um, the, the, the social side to this and, and also the, the processual, like how does this, what, does the, what do these things do for people who engage in them rather than is this true or not or are, are we being lied to or not um, is uh, very important to um, attend to. Thank you, Sarah. Um, but I'm immediately curious, Peter, uh, what do you think of Sarah mentioning this or emphasizing this social side uh, and that mode of sociality uh, to conspiracy theorists. Yeah, I, you know, I think you're spot on because you know the the stereotype of the conspiracy theorist is the because precisely because they're they're paranoid, they don't trust anyone, therefore they must be alone. Um, the the pleasure of conspiracy theorizing is that it taps you into a community. Um, that sense of community has been there for a long time. For example, with Kennedy assassination buffs in the 1960s, they would exchange letters and pamphlets, and then they would meet in conferences. Now it's done on the internet. Um, but I think those understanding those kind of pleasures of belonging to a group and being that sense of being in the know, possessing some kind of secret information is, is absolutely key to this. What I think is then really worrying, particularly in terms of your project on politics and play, is whether conspiracy theories and other forms of populism then completely replace more sensible, I would suggest, or kind of more realistic forms of politics because it seems it feels to people like they're engaged in politics and it feels like they're part of a political movement but most of the time it's you know it's tilting at wind windmills it's fantasy stuff so that's my worry that with you know the social media can create this fantasy of connection but ultimately it's it's hollow yeah well they, it's it's interesting because i think in some ways, if it really was hollow, we wouldn't need to worry about it. You know, it's yeah, like yeah. we do research and we believe that, that because of our methods, what we do is more sensible. I, I truly believe that. Um, and other people do maybe the same thing, um, but they don't publish in the same journals. <laughs> and and um, so I think in some ways the real problem or, or part of the, what makes it so problematic is that there is that what's going on is also um, 
might be call, called meta gaming. And then meta gaming in the in the gaming world is is this idea that when you play with someone, and you make use of information that you have about one of the other players from your real life, and you use that in the game, right? That so you use information from another the world outside of the game in the world of the game. That's um, that's meta gaming. But that's something that you also see all kinds of varieties of in particularly these kinds of, um, you know, Baudet on the internet and the same politician um, in, the, in the House of Representatives. Or, you know, he will say things in the House of Representatives, and not just he, you know, all, all politicians perhaps, will say things in the House of Representatives because they know it will play well on TikTok. And, and so there's a sort of um, back and forth between different worlds where what plays well on TikTok um, influences what is being said in the House of Representatives and influences in, in ways that are, um, well, troublesome and, and can be um, undemocratic or destabilizing, delegitimizing. Um, so I think, I think in some ways the problem is that it's not just this echo chamber, it actually has real like, impact in, in, in kind of traditional politics yeah. as well. And, and that exactly makes it un, not hollow, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it, it's, it, maybe it's, it began as something hollow, but that gives it, mm -hmm. that means that it dominates the news cycle um, to the cost of all the other things that are happening that also need that maybe need our attention far more urgently and mm -hmm. our action. Yeah. Um, I, I was quest uh, wondering, Peter, you said something in your presentation about the demand side of uh, conspiracy theory. And, and I was wondering, maybe both of you can respond to this or say something about it, about why exactly people turn to these narratives and, and what that demand side in that sense looks like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think we can think about both uh, the question from the individual perspective, but also the social perspective. So, you know, individuals turn to conspiracy theories for all kinds of different reasons. Um, and, you know, in a psychological sense, often it's uh, a sense of uncertainty or anxiety, which, you know, might well be perfectly justified in, in current times. Um, often people who are hardcore conspiracy theorists will have some kind of emotional or psychological disturbance in their life, that that's uh, a kind of a pattern that we see again and again. But I think we actually need to think about the question more at the social level. Mm -hmm. Why is it not just this one individual turn to conspiracy theories in their life story. But why is it that at particular historical moments, large numbers of people turn to particular kinds of conspiracy theories? And I think you know, we're making a real mistake if we think, well, we'll just psychologize them all individually. Instead, we need to actually listen in. What are the grievances that people have? Why do they feel that they're not being listened to? Um, and we need to think about you know, the way that there are different kinds of groups who turn to conspiracy theories at different times. In the US, you know, African Americans have quite high levels of belief in conspiracy theories, particularly about um, the medical establishment, but for very good reasons. And there are very good reasons why minorities might be distrustful of medical and political authorities. And I think of, you know, to dismiss that merely as a, a kind of uh, a, a failure of individual psychology is, is to, uh, to misunderstand why these narratives become popular. Yeah, so I, I think, yeah, no, I, I, I really, if you, if you look at it, I agree with you, particularly also because um, most politicians, um, certainly in the United States, but, but I think here as well, um, actually, in a way, what they do is, is a very strange act, right? They represent, particularly American presidents, represent millions of people. And at the same time, there is this demand on them that they are very honest and spontaneous and authentic um, themselves. And at the same time, they have to channel you know, everyone 
And we know, everyone knows that, that they, they're influenced very heavily by the hundreds of, of lobbyists and, and they are paid by, um, by all kinds of um, super PACs and whatnot um, to use particular phrases and so on. So they have to do, you know, to do that for money and they have to make, you know, perform that they're representing everyone and they have to be authentic and themselves and, you know, that's, that is going to look artificial, you know, it's, 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 and so, you know, the sense that they're not being entirely honest, that they're not being quite straightforward, that they're, that there is a lot behind what they're saying, you know, that's not untrue. Um, and, and, and so, and I think for Donald Trump, that's really quite different than for Hillary Clinton, for instance. There is, a, um, which is not to say that, that um, so I, I, that I um, would personally prefer Donald Trump, but it is, but it is understandable, I think, on that level that, that, you know, people distrust someone like Hillary Clinton, not, and you know, there's of course also then layers of, of sexism and everything, the unimaginability of a female president in America uh, that played a role in that. Um, so yeah, I, I think there, there's, there's also, uh, there's that, and particularly with regard to, to um, you know, African American distrust of, of the healthcare system in the US, that has been and and is to this day very um, uh, heavily imbued with with racism. You know that that really that there's uh, it's now less visible, less expressed, also just less probably. But but there's you know a long tradition of of um, particularly racist eugenics in the U.S. That that is just true, and, and that that kind of that is not long ago. That's. Uh, um, so yeah, I mean that's that is all to say. A lot of conspiracies have some sort of truth to them. And maybe it, it's a weird question, but I mean, or maybe it's even a, a too big of a question. But is there anything we can do to um, uh, uh, make that trust, or anything that we can do to make these institutions or these public figures, in that sense, more? Uh, trustworthy can or maybe in a, maybe this is a strange question but would conspiracy theories also be sort of mobilized to turn everything around to improve the yeah. system yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know <laughs> um, <laughs> um, it's I, I don't, so I think it, to make people feel heard, you have to hear them, <laughs> right? There is a sort of, I think um, you know, ultimately there is, it is true that, that in any case in the United States, there is a system that is, the, the system is very much, um, like allows very little space for, um, like the demos in a sort of, you know, uh, people to think of themselves as, de as mm -hmm. subjects in a democracy who have real political influence. And so that, that, is, that is one reason why people uh, understandably disengage from that and, and think that, you know, a, um, a, a good boss and, and, and then some, having a good boss and then some fun on the internet is, is and a weapon is is better because they, it does give them more agency, um, and so you know reviving the sense of being or reviving suggests that it exists that it did exist before, which is true for some people, but certainly not for all. Mm -hmm. um, but that you know, I, I think that that is um, technically. Yeah. possible but yeah. I, I don't see it happening <laughs> I, in, in maybe differently phrased um, Peter mentioned we need to take those grievances uh, seriously um, uh, do you think it would help uh, if public institutions or um, 
people would actually sort of in that sense research those conspiracy theories and 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 really seriously look at what are are those grievances and how can we address them or yeah you know i i have every sympathy for people working in uh, government agencies or large corporations you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't if you don't respond to the conspiracy theories um, from critics you're accused of hiding something being afraid to uh, address the truth and if you do address them then you're just amplifying them so there is no simple answer but um, there are things I think that we can do. One thing is that governments and corporations and uh, institutions need to be aware of the conspiracy theories that are circulating. So I was just asked by journalists, uh, I've had quite a few requests today, um, President Biden yesterday talked about a new world order, you know, which is in the current situation in Ukraine makes perfect sense. You know, but this is the phrase that rings alarm bells for every conspiracy theorist out there. So if you're going to use it, you need to kind of really understand uh, how it's going to play. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, the solution is not to try and address every conspiracy theory directly because you end up playing whack-a-mole. Uh, it is impossible to argue against a committed conspiracy theorist because conspiracy theories are ultimately uh, unfalsifiable. The evidence that you present against the conspiracy theory is then taken by the conspiracy theorist as evidence for the conspiracy. You say, but there's no proof of this. And they say, but that's because the conspiracy is so powerful, they have been able to remove any evidence. So you're never going to win that argument. And trust me, I've, uh, I've tried. Um, and so there are two things that I think we need to do. One is at the individual level. You know, when people have gone down the rabbit hole, and this has been especially the case with QAnon and COVID conspiracy theories, when there are many, many accounts of people whose relatives and loved ones have gone down the rabbit hole, it's really hard to speak to them and to bring them back because these echo chambers become ever more intense. And the secret there is, is not to kind of get angry with them and not to kind of just try and bash them over the head with the facts but to understand why they might be feeling anxious, why the, try and understand why they're turning to these conspiracy theories and show some empathy, show some understanding that this is a difficult situation for everyone. And also ask them questions about where they're, why they uh, are believing this particular theory. Keep on asking questions rather than getting into a shouting match. So that's at the individual level. But at the more kind of social level, we need to think politically about what are the underlying reasons that people are turning to conspiracy theories. It doesn't mean that we have to agree with all of those. A large part of support for Trump, for example, and other populist politicians around Europe is racist, xenophobic, is based on the loss of white male privilege. There's no denying that that ultimately is what's driving a lot of this. And so you can't condone it. You can't say, well, yes, you know, I, I understand your grievance and I fully support it, but we shouldn't take the alternative tack, which was Hillary Clinton's unguarded comment calling Trump supporters a basket of deplorables. Um, you know, I think the Democrat Party in the US, but also left-wing parties around Europe, need to understand why so many traditional working class voters who would ordinarily in the past have turned to Labour parties, why they've moved away from those and have now started to support right-wing 
parties. That's what we need to understand, to understand the, the way that those forms of xenophobia and racism and anti-immigrant sentiment play into these quite understandable sense of betrayal from um, the, the traditional left. So if I'm right, you're saying you have to be quite empathetic or try to be empathetic to people with conspiracy theory ideas. Um, and if, am I right then if you actually say that this is uh, very much about emotion and uh, that in a sense that if, the conspir if conspiracy theorists are... Uh, it's, it's more than, in that sense, an information problem and also really an, an emotion uh, problem. I, I don't know if that's a thing. I was wondering, you, you mentioned in your last show, your last sentence here in recommendations is a public service internet question. I mean, I'm very curious to hear more about what you mean with this exactly, but do we also have to take into account emotion when thinking about a new public service internet? <laughs> so um, so I, would, I would kind of see those two things as separate. Right. You're, I think you're right that conspiracy theories are less to do with information than emotion, but of course the conspiracy theorist thinks the opposite. To understand that, you know, if we think about the comparison with religion, if you, if you are a sociologist of religion, you say the reason why you as an individual or you as a group believe in your religious beliefs is for these kind of, you know, historical, sociological, cultural reasons. And it's to do with emotion and belonging and upbringing and so on. But to the individual, they believe in what they believe because it's true to them. Me, as someone, you know, I'm not religious, so from the outside, you know, I think the, the belief is bizarre. It makes no sense to me from the outside. But from the inside of a religious belief, as for the inside of a conspiracy theory, you believe it because it immediately strikes you as true. And I think that that understanding, that kind of emotion is at the heart of it. It's not just that it's driven by anxiety, uh, an uncertainty, but it's also the emotion. I think, Sarah, Sandra, you pointed out that, that sense of uh, enjoyment. It's pleasure. These things are pleasurable. There is a, a thrill in being in on the secret knowledge, being the one person in the room who's seen through all the lies. Everyone else is, is part of the sheeple, the kind of idiots who believe that stuff. But I, I'm special because I've seen through it. So I think we need to understand that. But the public service internet, I would suggest, is different. The model is the model of a public service broadcaster like the BBC in the UK or, to a lesser degree, the uh, NOS here. The idea that um, um, its remit is not profit but for the benefit of the people. These are not state broadcasters in the way that Russian TV is. These are um, forms of um, communication that are organized for the benefit of the people. And so is there a way of conceiving of an internet that would be organized along the same lines? Yeah, so the, the affordances of, of social media platforms that exist now are driven largely, as, as everyone knows, by the fact that these are private companies that want to make a profit. And so want to feed you what you will like, because that way they have more revenue from, from, from advertisements, I believe. If you're happy watching those advertisements. So um, yeah, so public service internet would, would change that more towards you know, the sort of public omroep model that there is in the Netherlands would change those affordances maybe to, to um, the, the, a comparison that I've heard, heard often is, is that, you know, it's this, um, YouTube, for instance, is like a supermarket, but if you've bought one packet of crisps once, it will only offer you hundreds of different types of crisps and never an apple anymore. 
and, and you know, a public service internet would still also have apples on display. Um, so I think that's a, that's a good point. I, I did think with the, with the emotion issue, I, I, I think we do have to be careful that, because it can, of course, be very patronizing. Also, vis-a-vis -vis religion to say, look, you are religious because this is good for you. This is, this is doing something for you socially and emotionally. And, and I study this from a distance and I, 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 uh, I can, you know, and, and that is exactly, that, that is also what my Illuminati confusion is about, is exactly what also, what this, what people do who engage in this, to say, I am the only one in this room who is enlightened about this. Um, and, and so there is a, um, a yeah, so I, I, and I think another thing about um, what has perhaps changed is that, um, and this was sort of linking into what you were saying about different, um, the, say, labors, kind of original or, or natural electorate, is, is that a lot of those parties, particularly on the left, have lost their sense of, of the narrative. Like, what is our narrative that, that our voters really... And, and I think that there is also a real um, role, not just for, you know, presenting, sending out a story that people uh, want to buy into, but also um, these things are now in, in today's world and through and as a result and per, part of social media, um, we are expecting something more interactive there. So, you know, when Trump says something like, um, uh, my nuclear button is larger than Kim Jong-un's, uh, that immediately calls up all of these memes of, of two men with buttons, and, and that, that, that is a sort of, it's a kind of an invitation of the, send me your jokes about this. And, and that is something that, that works really well, even for people who dislike Trump, would never vote for him, would still find those things funny, kind of almost despite themselves. And I think that is something that, that um, you know, could be used also by, by politicians and, and governments more. Mm -hmm. If there are any questions in the room, by the way, because we're, we're talking here on the stage, but um, do raise your hands. Uh, there will be walk, someone walking around. Uh, there, there is a microphone, so. Um, I apologize because uh, it will not be formulated exactly like a question, but more mm. a statement like. Uh, first, uh, audit of algorithm, uh, I do not believe whatever the outcome of, of possible outcome of it uh, is, uh, it doesn't help uh, much because what is behind the, the algorithm is a business model of the social media. So, uh, practical economy and business model is a, 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 a general mode of uh, uh, doing business nowadays. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, I do not uh, see much uh, uh, in comparison, uh, making comparison between conspiracy theories and religion. Much uh, better with the uh, ideologies, because actually, do we uh, have a neoliberal or Marxist or whatever uh, ideological belief? We do not test it. So it uh, belongs to that uh, what uh, Karl Popper would call speculative thinking and not empirical uh, uh, thinking and, and, and checking the, the evidence. Uh, the, um, the third thing is that you mentioned rightfully uh, social media and uh, um, uh, Fox News. Um, uh, there is also uh, 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 mirror imaging in the uh, in the media like uh, CNN and MCNBC because practically you can see significant shift from news production to conspiracy theories. How? Because uh, for uh, several years it was uh, main topic was RussiaGate. If there was any substance of it. Uh, the, Donald Trump would be uh, uh, rightfully arrested. Uh, there is no uh, uh, practical uh, evidence of conspiracy theory in terms of Russiagate. So, practically, uh, there are uh, 
that is difficult to swallow, but practically there is a, a how to say, Republican discourse and a democratic discourse, but they are uh, both have a populist uh, uh, versions of it. And that actually distracts from the uh, um, um, democratic uh, uh, direction of the population because that doesn't endanger uh, uh, um, any, how to say, company interest or whatsoever, and perfectly uh, 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 makes two uh, polarized <laughs> parts of the population busy not with the substantial things. Peter, I saw you write some things down. Do you uh, want to respond? You can, you can take the, the yeah. Russia gate on. <laughs> if I do the, so the, the algorithm, you're right that uh, the algorithm on its own is, is not the problem. It's the underlying political economy of the platforms. And that political economy is the controversy um, it is what they're interested in because controversy increases engagement engagement increases ad revenue. The social media platforms don't care what produces controversy, but the algorithm is finely tuned to increase controversy, and conspiracy theories play into that. And so that's one of the reasons I think we need to know more about the algorithm, or rather get social media platforms to recognize that their business model is fundamentally kind of anti-democratic, hate-filled, um, no matter what they claim about um, promoting liberal values of, of free speech. Um, the second point about you know, the better comparison being ideology rather than religion, once again, I think religion is a better comparison because it is to do with a, a complete sense of identity, community, belonging and emotion whereas kind of political ideology we were still we're still going to be kind of seeing conspiracy theories as merely forms of kind of factually or theoretically wrong um, statements and that to me is is misguided i'll leave you to uh, <laughs> about russia gate um yeah well like I, two points actually one is that in the United States, and I'm trying to recall what the act was called, it's something fair, fair something, fair representation or something, but I, I have to look it up, but it was, that was in place until the 1990s, um, when actually news outlets, um, wherever they were on the political spectrum, had to you know, represent both sides of arguments. And doing away with that, in the 90s, which was sort of in, in the period that also, you know, cyberspace was, was you know, coming into its own, I, I would say, um, that, was, that, was, um, that law um, was discarded. And so that has really also produced a great deal of the polarization of the uh, American media landscape, not just on the internet. Um, and you're right that there are two, um, you know, you can have sort of a red bubble and a blue bubble that are next to each other that tell completely different truths. And in a sense, um, it's, it's not even that the one is factually more right than the other, or if in terms of fact checking, but they tell such different stories that, that it is impossible for those two to talk to each other. I agree with that. What I disagree with is the suggestion that this is symmetrical between the left and the right. I think that currently conspiracy theories that have a great deal of currency are particularly on the right end of the political spectrum and also that um, the, the, the sort of, of um, playing with that both through um, irony and through the sort of cycle that Peter described of it getting onto into info wars onto Fox News um, and sort of recycled it, that that um, on the right of the political spectrum is at least far more effective for far more influential right now um, than on the left of the political and that has been different in the past and is no doubt different in different places as well. Yeah I would say also the important thing is that it's not a to both sides are as bad as one another because particularly in the US, the center has lurched dramatically to the right. That it's um, the, the kind of 
forms of network prop propaganda uh, along the Fox News model is fundamentally altering the political landscape where there is not a symmetry between left and right. Um, I would also disagree with you on some of the specifics of Russia Gate, uh, <laughs> but we can uh, talk, uh, before, talk about that. Before we get into that, I, I think there was another question somewhere in the back. Two questions. Um, I, I leave uh, Marijn with the mic to choose uh, <laughs> who gets to raise the first question. Uh, thank you. Uh, stand up so I can see you. Um, I, have a, I would like to hear your thoughts on a, uh, an insight that I got uh, about this. I'm a, I'm a scientist, I'm a professor at the university, um, and it occurred to me to wonder about the currency that we feel rewarded by. As a practicing scientist in a university and an academic, I'm rewarded by being part of a majority. I want my research to be supported by my discipline, disciplines related to it, all of the machinery of publication and review and revision and conferences and presentation is designed to generate a large group of people working with a lot of common belief. Now, you have this delicate balance of you want to do something new, because otherwise you're not going to get uh, anywhere in your career. But it's, I want to be part of a majority. I have some friends who have fallen down the rabbit hole that you mentioned. And in interaction with them, it becomes clear that they want to be special. They want to be you know, the majority of scientists, the majority of academics, the mainstream media all think this, but I know better. And you mentioned something about wanting to be the only person in the room. It, I think it does connect to religions because many, most all, religions in some sense view themselves as special. They're chosen, they're, they're the ones that God likes and everybody else doesn't. So to look at the other side, the, the side, the reward that is valuable to the people who aren't conspiracy theorists, who don't see value in being somebody with a YouTube channel that nobody else agrees with, but you know the truth. And I find that that makes it really hard to communicate because when I say, look, uh, I can go to PubMed and find a hundred articles that have analyzed the safety of these vaccines and here's the, all the different things they've found, to me that feels really good. To the people I'm arguing with, it's like, yeah, yeah, that's just the establishment. That's big pharma. That's, you know, all these other reasons. So I'd, I'd be interested in your comments on this difference in what we count as valuable. Sarah? No, I, 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 I'm afraid I completely agree with you. And I think I also really recognize the other side. Also, you know, within my discipline, I want to be special. <laughs> and a lot of academics, I would say, the majority have that same, you know, want to say, everyone says this, this is the argument, it sounds reasonable, yet I completely disagree with it. It should be, you know, that's really part of the... Of, of, of what we also do. While you're, of course, right that to some extent you, you do have to um, get past peer review and so on. And so there are a lot of incentives to, to belong to the majority to some extent or to only you know, push the boundaries a bit. Um, but I, I, um, on, on that level, I really see that. I really remember you know, as a kid, there were particular comics I didn't want to read because everyone was reading them. You know, that, that, that's, that's sort of, and, and so because something is in, you know, because something is fact-checked in, checked in the New York Times, that, you know, that doesn't give you any more reason to believe it because it's in the New York Times to begin with. You know, that's, that's already something, uh, you know, that you've discarded as the establishment. I, I um, yeah, 
um, I find that part of it very easy to follow, actually. Um, the perhaps harder to follow part of it is that um, is is that you that there's no sense of falsifiability, or there's no you 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 would feel you know you would like to think, or I at least like to think. Okay, so what would convince me of this thing that I don't right now believe? And you know, if I then find it, then I, I would. Um, so yeah. How is this for you, Peter? See so, yeah. The, the picture of ac academia that you present is, I think, quite a utopian one that is maybe not uh, empirically true. I mean, acad acad you know, the reward system for academia is both collective but also highly individualized. Um, and I think the world of conspiracy theory is the same. I remember years ago when I went to a conspiracy um, buff conference in Dallas... Uh, looking at the Kennedy assassination. This is, you know, pre-internet. And I remember being struck by the way that it was just like an academic conference. So this was a bunch of people who thought, you know, obviously academics are idiots because they, they don't dare touch any of this. But they organized the whole thing just like an academic conference, but also with the same crucial kind of split reward system. On the one hand, it was all about the big stars. It was all about the fact that, you know, the keynote speakers would not be in the small panels carefully listening. They would be talking to the other keynote stars in the coffee room because they don't mix with mere mortals like us. At the same time, though, there was a deeply held political but also kind of emotional um, uh, uh, passion for discovering the truth. That's what they were motivated by. And that, that's kind of really struck me with the Rosenblum and Muirhead book. Their argument, this is the book uh, a lot of people are saying, their argument is that conspiracy theories are different now because people no longer are searching for the truth. It's all about um, just saying any old rubbish because it undermines objective truth that undermines democracy, it delegitimizes uh, um, this idea of uh, objectivity. But I don't think that's true. If you listen to most conspiracy theorists, not necessarily the, the kind of alt-right ones, but if you listen to most of them, they still believe in collectively pursuing the truth. If you, you know, the QAnon people, they thought they were onto something. They still do think they're onto something. And I think they, in that sense, they are actually more similar to the world of academia than, than not. And in fact, in general, conspiracy theories are very like academic forms of knowledge. They are about trying to see beneath the surface confusion, the surface detail, to the underlying deep structures. Freud, when he was doing his... Um, uh, a case study of paranoia, said that the thing he found most disturbing was that he couldn't easily distinguish between the speculations that he was making as a doctor and a scientist and the kinds of leaps, speculative leaps that the paranoid patient that he was examining. And I think that that's true in general, that there is a kind of disturbing close similarity before, between certain kinds of academic knowledge and conspiracy theories. And when you were talking earlier about that, it's so easy to be patronizing to conspiracy theorists. I think you're right, but I think we need to have this humility and recognize that actually academic knowledge, um, if we're not careful, can end up sounding quite like a conspiracy theory at times. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, th I think l looking at the time, it depends a little bit on how eager the gentleman in the back is with asking his question. Uh, I think Raoul, if I see it correctly. Um, maybe one last question and then uh, we'll round off the, the program. I, in a way, the conversation has kind of come around to what I was going to ask about, but the question was going to be, how do we study conspiracy theory without... 
are condescending towards people in, in implicated in them. But it feels like the study of conspiracy theory itself veers between these extremes of either condescension or identification, where we end up appreciating the modes of sociality as not that dissimilar from, you know, where we are. So going back to the very concrete question of how do you tell a person that their legitimate grievance is being addressed in the wrong way and that there is some other way to go about doing this without condescension? Uh, I'm just curious uh, about your thoughts around that. Do you have any, do you have any <laughs> no, well, like, yeah, I find I find this very difficult. I mean, because uh, the, and the key thing that I tend to find difficult about it, I was talking before about the sort of lack of falsifiability. I do sometimes ask a friend of mine, so what what kind of evidence might you know push your convictions, and. And you know, so so what form would that have? Not that I even have it, but they, what would? I think as a meta discussion, that's interesting, but it hasn't produced a serious uh, shift. The other thing that I think um, is, or, or that the the debate sometimes ends up being about, is um, is the everything is connected point of golden rules. Is if you believe that everything is connected, it's easy to see that. Um, and and that is, that is something that that um, that I just don't don't um, embrace as a premise, and so that is that is where you know. So I, I find the sort of trying to make an inventory of, of where the dis distinctions are um, helpful, um, and also, um, but that's that's slightly different. Is what I think, but you know, that's of course a projection. What I think the actual grievance is, which is usually a political issue that I that I can totally empathise with, uh, you know, without even talking about the content of the conspiracy theory. There was um, a TV programme years ago in the UK uh, by Michael Moore, and in one episode, um, he meets with uh, one of the uh, generals from the militia in Michigan. And, you know, Michael Moore is, is from Michigan. They, um, but, of course, you know, politically, they're on completely opposite sides. And Michael Moore's a bit worried about meeting this guy who's in uniform and carrying guns and everything. And they take a ride on an old Ferris wheel together. And as they're going kind of round, slowly round this Ferris wheel, there's a really amazing conversation they had that I take as inspiration for how do you, how do you kind of manage to not be condescending at the, but at the same time recognize that um, you can't just give in to uh, falsity when you see it. And the approach that Michael Moore took was to try and find points that the two of them had in common. They both, they both grew up in Rust Belt families, um, uh, blue-collar families, they both had seen that world that they knew of corporate welfare capitalism disappear. But the explanations, the narratives, the stories they each told about why that had happened and what it meant were different. But the underlying sense that there was a problem and the sense of connection was, was genuine. And so I think that idea of being able to take seriously someone else's views, to respect that they are believing in it because to them it seems factually true, to respect it by, as I, you know, I think you're, you're right that one of the things that we can do is, is say, what would it take for you to change your mind? What would, the, what would kind of the argument go like? Um, to kind of engage where relevant in those conversations about levels of fact, but to recognize that when you're dealing with conspiracy theories, chances are you're never going to get anywhere. Therefore, more productive is trying to see where there are points of connection, where the narratives that are, are in which their political worldview is articulated can have something in common with your own, and to get them to recognize that maybe you share something even if the explanation you have is, is different. I think on that note, 
this is the end of this program. Who would have thought that we, speaking about conspiracy theories, would end up talking about empathy for each other? <laughs> nice. Uh, I think that's a very positive note. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Sarah and Peter. And um, maybe good to mention, on the 5th of April, we have another NIAS talk coming up about something completely different. Uh, we're going to talk about multi lingualism and the early modern Mediterranean. Thank you. <laughs>